You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Join us now for the expert source for inside information on the options markets. It's time for Options Insider Radio with your host, Mark Longo. Welcome back to Options Insider Radio, the interview program here on the old network where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of options and derivatives and proceed to Pick their brains for the benefit of you, the listener. My name is Mark Longo, and if I sound a little bit different, because I'm not coming to you from our studio in Chicago, no, I'm coming to you from our traveling studio, or on-the-road studio here in sunny Florida for the Options Industry Conference 2019, so stay tuned for a lot of great content from us coming at you from this conference throughout the, throughout the next couple of weeks, actually. There'll be a lot hitting the network, so stay tuned for that, and kicking it all off I couldn't think of a more appropriate guest, our old friend, Mr. Ed Boyle, the CEO over there at Box. Ed, welcome back to the network, sir. It has been too long, I think exactly a year. Yes, it has. Thanks, Mark. It's, uh, it's exciting to be here. It's, uh, I don't know if it's sunny Florida. I think it's pouring rain outside right In now. In here, I can imagine. In here, I can imagine everything is sunny. A little bit better than Chicago, so all good. <laughs> well, let's kick it off. It has been pretty much exactly a year since you and I last sat down in a room like this and chatted. So, so catch our listeners up. What's, what's the last year been like for Box? What are some of the, the highlights in your mind for things that really stand out for Box over the past year? I think um, for Box in general, uh, 2018 was a uh, kind of the, the coming out year for our trading floor, we, which we opened in late 2017. 2018 is where we got things moving along. And 2018 in general was a, a, a good year in the options markets all as it was simply because we brought volatility back, volumes were up. Uh, so it made it a good year overall, and it helped us to uh, get that floor effort jump started, as well as uh, in, just in general being able to be more targeted in how we uh, go after our clients and how we interact with that client base and the value we can bring to them. Let's talk about that trading floor a little bit, because I think obviously when you say trading floor to our listeners, it probably conjures up a certain image, right? They, they think of a, of a caffeinous, cavernous, monstrous thing, guys in jackets yelling, screaming, walk-in brokers, madness, all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, paint a visual picture for our audience of, of the box trading floor, what it really looks like. And, and you said it's been a, a pickup year for you guys over there. What, what kind of stuff is going up down there? What's trading down there? Yeah, so the, uh, I'll start off with the visual. It is a cavernous room. Well, not really. It's more like an <laughs> office. Um, and in today's world, large, you know, other than some of the trading floors like the New York Stock Exchange, perhaps, it still has a big, large presence, which is a big media presence in a way. The tra trading floors of today are much more, uh, have adapted to the electronic world. So you've got the market makers and the brokers basically sitting behind walls of monitors with, and they're really just living in the digital world. But the difference in the trading floor is that the trading floor gives them the ability to expose the orders to the marketplace in an open outcry fashion. So that's, the, that's what brings the value to open, to open outcry trading floors in today's marketplace. Are there particular names or series that are trading more frequently down there on the floor, or is it kind of a smattering? What are the, what are the big names trading down there? No, it's really, it is a smattering, but it's, um, you know, of course, you still see the, uh, the strategy trades like dividend plays and things like that that go up. So you'll see those during dividend times. I think in the first quarter, uh, Lilly had a, was a big, uh, had a huge volumes oh, due to that. Oh, box becoming the new Philly, so, the, new, the new home for div plays? Yeah, no, no, we, we haven't, uh, as a matter of fact, we haven't done a div play on our floor that I know of yet. Um, and that's not the kind of what we focus on. We try to focus, really what we're trying to focus on is the, the value that a trading floor brings with the exposure of the order. And that's, they, it keeps those orders from living in that high frequency or high speed world. And um, that's not something that 
we want to see with the general population of orders, and you don't. The open outcry trading floors, in our best estimate, are somewhere between 15 and 18 percent of total volume. So while they're that's significant, they're not dominant by any means. And the reason we opened the trading floor was just simply to give us access to that segment. Without that access to that segment, Box couldn't compete at the same level as some of the other organizations. And and we're we really go after kind of niche volume. We work directly with our participants to find areas that they need, gaps that they need filled in their business models, and that's what we go after. And that's why we're not a multi-SRO exchange at the point. this point. We're not, a, um, we're not a high market share exchange point, and that's due to those reasons. You, you know, it's interesting because I, I haven't been – I want you to come check out the, the box floor one of these days and see it for myself. But you mentioned kind of that niche – of the market, there still clearly is a, a substantial percentage of the audience out there that that likes that high touch execu- execution, whether it's for a complex order, whether they just prefer uh, their ec- order executed in that way. There certainly is still a, a, a fairly sizable amount of the of the audience out there that likes that. So clearly, there's a niche you guys are are, are able or going after to target, I should say. Now. Uh, Size-wise, like what kind of, how, like, you know, you think of a crowd, you think of maybe the old SPX days or the old even IBM days. You know, how, how big of a crowd are we talking here? The crowds are small in today's world. Um, currently in the options market, I don't know that the, the only large crowd that I'm f- familiar with is the, uh, the SPX crowd at the CBOE. And that's still a very large crowd because those are predominantly traded in open outcry. Um, in the equities on all the trading floors, there's no crowd I don't think that exceeds uh, two or three people. And that's really kind of where it sits in these, the, today's world, because the electronic trading is still the dominant way to trade, even with auctions and the other methodologies people use for order execution. But to your point earlier, there's a there's a handful of the kind of buy side institutional group that still wants those high that high touch order. They don't need that speed and throughput that the marketplaces offer, and the trading floors work much better for them from an information leakage standpoint, et cetera, et cetera. So. Um, you know, again, the trading floors, they're really, they're, how, what they really are today is they're guys who are electronic traders sitting behind their, their walls of monitors, and then every now and then one of these orders pops up, and they have time to interact with it, provide liquidity to it, and, uh, and work through the details of the order as it gets presented to the marketplace. One of the reasons I like talking with you, Ed, is because I get a chance to to catch up on the latest in the, in the suite of box proprietary products. You guys are always, to your credit, you're always throwing things against the wall to see what sticks. Of course, you had Jumbo Spy. We had uh, the real vol slash real day stuff. Give us an update. Uh, what's, what's the latest? How, how are things standing right now with the suite of proprietary products you guys are working on? Well, the, uh, the real day stuff is something that we're, we're somewhat uh, disappointed. We haven't been able to get to the market. We've got SEC approval for it. We've got the systems built for it. We're ready to go with it. But we've got a problem with OCC, and that OCC's clearing system can't support it. Um, OCC has been struggling the last few years, as we all know, with their, their current uh, Encore platform. They've got plans in place now to, to start a, to put a new platform in place by, I think the due date right now is 2021. Um, and that's, that's somewhat disappointing that we can't launch many of these new products that we have ideas for simply because the clearing side of it can't be handled. So we've looked at some ideas behind is there ways that we could do something either that fits into the current clearing and risk models because that's the only thing they're going to be able to bring up. Um, I give my ex credit for getting their spikes index up. That was a, they really were able to use the current clearing models at, at uh, OCC or risk models is what it was all, all about to get that product up. So that was good for them. Um, but we don't have anything that's pending today that we're waiting on other than what's in the queue. I know one of the issues with, uh, in addition to the, to the risk modeling, one of the issues with Real Vol, Real Day was the underlying of the future. I know there was some talk about maybe you guys even getting into that space of the box futures exchange. Is that still on the table, or is that kind of... Um, yeah, no, that's still on the table. It's something that we have kept to continue to keep an eye on. Um, it's hard to... The whole idea behind this is that we need to get the the business model built and the liquidity providers brought in. And interestingly enough, 2018, with things heating up in the beginning of 2018, when we saw the volatility blow up and the trading, the, the trading firms, the liquidity side of it, they got busy really quickly. And many of them, I'm not going to say were understaffed, but they didn't have a lot of extra bandwidth. So therefore, when it came to supporting these products, it was like, hey, right now we've got enough to do. The markets are treating us well. Let's, uh, let's focus on our core business and not focus on that, that new uh, starting a new exchange, so to speak. Speaking of new exchanges, obviously we, we've had a new entrant since the last time you and I sat here. I think we're up to 16 now, somewhere in that uh, in that <laughs> that ridiculous range. My ex uh, adding a third exchange. You kind of hinted at it earlier. Sounds like Box is not playing in that game, Ed. 
no, we're not playing in that game. And we, we've never thought that just adding SROs to, to be another me too uh, fee structure um, with running or running inverted markets was a good idea. It's a different business model. Um, and again, my ex, uh, that's the business model they're running. They, you know, grow it and they will come kind of thing. The idea that the regulators continue to, and in some ways their back is up against the wall, they can't really tell someone, no, you can't start another exchange. But, you know, there's the business model out there that we just keep launching exchanges until we have 50 of them. Uh, we continue to fragment liquidity. We don't think that's healthy for the market. We're not playing that game because we think it undermines the market more than helps the market. We'd rather continue to improve the market as it exists today rather than uh, continue to uh, fragment it or make it not as usable as it once was. And you know that's been a lot of the concentration this year by the industry, is how do we start to reduce some of the risk that's out there. And one of the problems that we have with risk right now is that we've got too many exchanges and too many strikes. So what happens when you have 950,000 strikes thereabouts and you start to put them on 16 exchanges, you can see where the multiples get just ridiculous. And then the problem you have is the market makers that you want to provide liquidity People don't understand if a market maker has an order in the market sitting on the screen, that's risk. He's got what they call, everybody refers to as open order risk. And you are starting to deteriorate what we're able to actually use as our call it advertising, the quotes on the screen, how good can they be when you've got this huge risk problem and we have less market makers, less liquidity providers. So we're working, um, there's a committee out there, uh, the Loam Swag Committee that Paul Giganti and Slade Winchester have been heading up and that's one of our core uh, mandates right now by the committee itself is to reduce the number of strikes that are out there. And it's not to say, hey, we got, to, you know, there, let's just limit the number of strikes. It's saying, let's get the strikes that don't make sense off the screen. The spy that's uh, $200 out of the money that uh, there's 450 strikes sitting out there. So things like that. So that's a, that's a one of the core philosophies Box has. How do we help our participants by reducing the risk they've got to put into the market to get the return they need? Now, is that a challenge for you guys then, not launching the other, you know, the new models and the new venues? Because you're right, they effectively are just new new fee structures, right? Calling them exchanges is probably it's probably charitable <laughs> at the end of the day. Does that is that a problem for you guys, being able to challenge those different segments without launching new venues? You see people, they want to go maker-taker, taker-maker, or taker, maker, or whatever whatever the fee segment they're trying to go after, usually a new medallion is the way they do that. Is that is that a liability for you guys, not having those? It, it is a weakness for us. It's, um, you know, in my, in my past, I've done, I've played that game before where, you do want to have multiple exchange. In order to compete at the level that our, our current competition is at, whether it's SIBO, NASDAQ, NYSC, or MIAX, without having multiple exchange medallions, you can't run the multiple fee structures that are really targeted at single audience participants or small groups of people. Um, so we've considered that, but again, we think it's, uh, it's not real healthy for the market. We don't see a lot of opportunity for our shareholders in that as well, and therefore we haven't, we haven't gone down that path. You mentioned the market makers, you know, the plight of market makers is an ongoing refrain at this conference. At least I bring it up every year. I'm glad to see uh, you guys are talking about it as well. We, it's kind of a, a lingering issue. Do you think that's the, the number one thing we could do right now to maybe try to ease their burden a bit? Is it just kind of reducing the amount of open order risk out there or maybe some other things we should be focusing on first? Uh, that, that's certainly open order risk is certainly one of them. The barriers to entry have continued to climb, <clears throat> excuse me, for the market maker community. Um, and Overall risk is probably the biggest cost for them to their business. There's also a lot of other costs of, of entering, which is if you gotta belong, if you gotta be in the marketplace, that means you're gonna have to belong to all 16 exchanges just so orders aren't going up where you have no opportunity to touch them. And there's uh, obviously risk to that, or not risk, but cost to that. And their systems have to be both built for the, the to be robust enough to handle that amount of traffic going through them, but as importantly is the amount of the cost associated with belonging to each and every one of those, getting their market data, getting your systems co-located with them, getting, paying the membership fees. So again, the fragmentation isn't helping that at all. Uh, I think one of the key things we could do to get more market liquidity side providers into the marketplace is reduce the number of exchanges. Is that gonna happen? Probably not. Doesn't make sense if you have them to not, to, you know, why are you gonna just close them down? Um, that's a, that's a really hard problem to solve. Right. Since we're talking about reducing uh, the amount of, uh, amount of strikes and the amount of exposure, let, let's flip the script for Let's flip the coin for a little bit. I always ask our audience before we come down here, what are some of the issues you'd like us to talk about? And every year, it seems like a couple are, are very popular, including particularly this time of year when it's during earnings season. A lot of people want to know about uh, the old saw of, of after-hours options trading. You know, they see their 
Google, they have Google stock, maybe they have Google options, they, want to, they can close out their stock, they can't close out their options after hours, it's a huge problem for a lot of people, they, they send it to me, so of course I, I have to ask you, Ed, do you think we're, uh, there's any progress on that front, or maybe is it an issue of, you know, the market makers already maybe stretched a little bit too thin, so adding additional hours of liquidity is just, just a non-starter right now? Yeah, I think um, we've talked about this for a number of years, you're right, and it's been, my whole career we've talked about trading options, you know, later into the evenings, and or even to 24 hours, but there's a number of problems. One is, yes, the market makers, you, much less trading is obviously going to happen at those hours. Therefore, you're putting more of a burden on the market makers because now they've got to have staffing, keep their systems up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the clearing systems is the other weakness in that. So uh, the o current OCC clearing system, I don't think could handle the 24-hour day. It doesn't have the capacity and ability to. I might be wrong in saying that. I haven't uh, spoken to OCC directly about that in years. But the, um, I think we, will, we really need to automate further before we're going to get to that. Well, obviously, this is the Options Industry Conference. People come down here for new developments, new announcements. Anything, anything in the hopper from Box? Any new announcements down here that we could look forward to? Um, we, we don't have any, uh, anything that we're uh, holding under our hat right now, waiting to, to flash out there to the crowd tomorrow morning. Uh, the, uh, there's a number of exciting things we've been up to, and one of them is that we're, our technology, which previously has always been done by the Toronto Montreal, one of our, our significant shareholders, uh, we're taking that in-house. So that's something that will give us the ability to be more flexible and be able to work quicker, respond to customer needs faster. So we're integrating that now into our platform. Uh, Toronto Montreal is still a very big supporter of Box and, a, a, again, our most significant shareholder. So they're, uh, they're very supportive of this endeavor that we're going down, and we're looking forward to getting that done. So as I said, we can respond quicker to our client needs. And when will when will that be ready? We'll get it. We're going to have it. Uh, up. It's, it stays operational. We're just migrating it or transitioning it over to our own team. Um, so it's not that we're. It's not a big bang kind of thing. It's, it'll be done throughout 2019. We should be done with it at uh, probably right at Q4 this year. Well, Adam, glad we can get you on for our annual check-in on all things box. I'll have to keep my eyes glued to that trading floor, see how things are going up, and maybe come check it out for myself one of these days. Yep. Yep, that'd be great. Well, uh, we're looking forward to it as well, and we're actually going to be moving it to a new space in 2020. That's uh, a good sign. You're already outgrowing your old your old abode there. Yeah, so. and it wasn't so much outgrowing it as much as that we done, had done a short-term lease initially, and we're going to be consolidating all of our office space into one area in Chicago. Well, great. Well, good catching up with you, and look forward to seeing how all this plays out in the marketplace in the coming months, sir. Great, Mark. Great to see you again. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 